Namaste and greetings. I, Dr. Simi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director at IMPRI Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nay Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy learning. Today we are gathered for the fourth and final session on gender, international relations and diplomacy as part of, the, of an online monsoon school program on feminist foreign policy, Praxis for a Peaceful and Gender Just World Order, organized every weekly, every weekly Friday of September, starting September 9th. This training course is being organized by the Friedrich E. Butch Stiftung FES India office and IMPRI Gender Impact Studies Center, GISC, IMPRI New Delhi. This monsoon school has been carefully planned, curated and organized to discuss the need for the much deserved recognition to the contributions of a, of a feminist foreign policy that provides a powerful lens through which we can counter the violent global systems of power that is patriarchy, racism, cultural nationalism, imperialism and militarism that leave the majority of the population in perpetual states of vulnerability and despair. The overall aim of this program has, to be, has been to advocate and promote gender equality and women's rights at the center of a nation's diplomatic agenda through rights, representation, and resources. This course will provide the participants with nuanced perspectives on the challenges towards gender equality locally, nationally, regionally, and globally, and advocates that the voices against the gender biases must be made more vocal which would aid in the steady elimination of exclusive masculine agencies over a period of time. The program themes covered in the past three weeks included gender, peace and security, gender dimensions of the UN Security Council, gender and, and sustainable development discourses. And today we will understand gender, international relations and diplomacy. The chair for this program is Professor Vibhuti Patel, Distinguished Visiting Professor, IMPRI, and Eminent Feminist Scholar and Economist. We are also grateful to our distinguished experts for gracing the Monsoon School. Dr. Swarna Raja Gopalan, Dr. Vahida Nainar, Professor Roxana Marinescu, Professor Vibhuti Patel, Professor Meenan Srivastava, Ambassador Anil Trigunayat, and Professor Neelima Srivastava. The conveners of this program are Ms. Jyoti Rawal from FES India, Dr. Simi Mehta and Dr. Arjun Kumar from IMPRI. I welcome all of you to this enlightening deliberation and I thank you for being interested and putting your time, energy and efforts into understanding the emerging issues concerning the impacts of policies in promoting gender equality and foreign policy and thereby helping us to bring together the practitioners and participants through this course for impactful policy and policy research and action. As you all are aware, the course outline and reading resources are available on the event page for your kind perusal. Before we start off today's program, uh, I would like to remind the housekeeping announcements once again. Please join the meeting on time. There will be a Q&A session after each presentation. Please share your questions on the Q&A box. The questions must not be posted as an anon anonymous attendee. Ensure that all your questions are precise and refrain from making general comments in order to save time. Now, let me introduce our experts for today's session on gender, international relations, and diplomacy. We are privileged to have Professor Meenal Srivastava as the expert speaker today. We are honored to have Ambassador Anil Trigunayat and Professor Neelima Srivastava, who would be delivering special remarks on the theme. Professor Meenal Srivastava, she is Professor and Coordinator of Political Economy and Global Studies at Athabasca University, Canada. Thank you very much, ma'am, for joining us from Canada very early your time, early in the morning, and gracing the monsoon school. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Ambassador Anil Trigunayat is former Indian Ambassador to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, Libya, and Malta. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. We really appreciate your presence. Professor Neelima Srivastava, Professor, School of Gender and Development Studies at Indira Gandhi National, Univers National Open University, IGNU, New Delhi. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your presence. We really look forward to learning from all of you. Now, without any further ado, let us start our program. 
it is my honor to invite Ms. Jyoti Rawal from FES India office to start the program with her remarks. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Simi Mehta, for this wonderful introduction of the webinar series and of the panel. This has really set the tone for the webinar today. So thank you very much for that. Dear Professor Minil Srivastav, dear Ambassador Anil Trigunayat, dear Professor Nilimar Srivastav, dear Dr. Vibhuti Patel, dear Dr. Arjun Kumar, and dear participants. On behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, it is my pleasure to be extending a very warm welcome to all of you to the concluding session titled Gender, International Relations and Diplomacy of the FES IMPRI webinar series on the feminist foreign policy. A big thank you to the IMPRI team and to Dr. Vibhuti Patel that we have been able to bring this webinar series to life. A very special welcome goes out to all our speakers today. I really appreciate your time and most of all, thank you so much for your generosity. In its essence, feminist foreign policy aims at promotion of values and good practices to achieve gender equality and to guarantee that all women enjoy their fundamental rights. The practice initiated in Sweden by Margaret Wallström, who was the former foreign affairs minister, Sweden also being the first country to have adopted feminist foreign policy way back in 2014. Margaret Wallström had said more women means more peace, as she explained her country's decision to become the first in the world to explicitly pursue a feminist foreign policy alongside a very strict gender equality law at home. Feminist foreign policy was later adopted by Canada, France, Luxembourg, Mexico, Spain, Libya, and Germany. Feminist foreign policy is seen as an approach that looks at feminist rights as more of a human rights issue than issue pertaining to a specific gender. In the fast changing realm of international relations and foreign policies, nation states do not have permanent alliances or partnerships, but they certainly do have permanent interests. And to be in the pursuit of gender justice is something all countries strive for. And hence, there is really a need to look be looking at our policies, both foreign policies and de development policies with a gender lens. We are aware that in the Indian context, despite a constitutional mandate providing equality to people of all genders, patriarchal mindsets continue and the ingrained societal and gender norms hamper the path to equality. Over the years, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung is an organization which is committed to the values of social democracy, has tried to address the aspect of gender equality through its various activities. FES is one of the oldest foundations of Germany dedicated to the values of peace, solidarity, and social justice. And in India, we've been uh, working since uh, 1983. And the, in the gender unit, we look at the aspects of women in work, women in politics, and uh, the issues of gender sensitization. The more we engage on the issues of uh, gender justice, the more we realize the work that still needs to be done, which is all the way all the more, in fact, the reason that we are very pleased that we have such eminent panelists amongst us today who will take us through the nuances of gender and international relations and diplomacy and how it connects to the feminist foreign policies. So without further delay, I'll request Dr. Vibhuti Patel to please share the session and take the event forward. I'm really looking forward to the unfolding of the session today. So a very warm welcome to all of you and thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Jyoti Rawal. First of all, I would like to greet Professor Meena Srivastava, Honorable Ambassador Anil Trigunayat, Professor Nilima Srivastava, Madam Jyoti Rawal, Dr. Arjun Kumar, Dr. Simi Mehta, and the esteemed participants. Today we have around 700 registrations on various platforms of MPRI, and we are really feeling quite inspired uh, by this kind of enthusiastic response. Now let us have a recap of this whole course. The day one began on 9th September with presentation by Swarna Rajkopal, which focused on gender, peace and security. And she also gave several examples of peacemaking, peace building, peacekeeping efforts by the feminists uh, around the world. In the second session uh, on 16th of September, 
uh, which was about gender dimension of UN Security Council, Dr. Vaida Nainar, based on her personal experience of working with the UNSC and being part of several international criminal courts and jury member uh, where the violation of uh, people's rights and the crimes against humanity had taken place and she discussed the how feminist interventions that humanized the whole discourse and also brought the question of uh, peace and the uh, 1325 the, the the resolution of the UNSC center stage and after that around 20 more uh, resolutions came up and women peace and security uh, WPS perspective started getting mainstream uh, in the third day, like on, on 30th, 23rd of September, myself and Professor Roxana Marinescu, we uh, highlighted the deliberations going on about the 2030 mission, that is a sustainable development discourses uh, uh, that are happening after 2015. And before that, also, we had a millennium development discourses in which both the targeted intervention uh, under goal number three of MDG and goal number five of SDG, <clears throat> and at the same time, gender mainstreaming of all the 17 goals of SG, uh, SDG have been uh, proclaimed. Today, in the concluding session on gender international relations and diplomacy, the we need to understand that the theoretical foundation of international relations are still primarily based on traditional male-female dichotomies, particularly that of a separate public and private spheres. By extension, women are largely excluded from state power and decision-making. The state is itself gendered. Recently, we have been hearing three words, democracy, dialogue, and diplomacy. Feminist interpretation of the international relation areas are focused on international security, human rights, international political economy, and its implications for the gender policies of the nation state. How gender is interacting with issues related to international relations, diplomacy, peace and security, development, human rights, and the economic policies, macroeconomic policies by the uh, different countries, that's very important. Regardless of whether or not one views gender as a mainstream or marginal, both within the academic study of international relations and in practice of international relations, it is apparent that gender issues have gained significant visibility in contemporary politics, especially in the 21st century, and it, which requires informed research and analysis. The idea of gender-sensitive foreign policy as a multidimensional policy framework that aims to include women's experiences has also been gaining traction with the collection of uh, several uh, interventions made by women and several publications that we have seen, which have been brought out by the UN Women, UNHRC, we, we realized that uh, the significance of gender in the study and practice of international relations is uh, now uh, gaining traction. And uh, we also, like even in, in developing countries, the, these questions have been de deliberated very, very seriously. Now uh, we have today Dr. Minal Srivastava, who will uh, enlighten us about gender, international relations, and diplomacy from a global perspective, uh, world economy as a unit of analysis. And I request uh, Professor Minal Srivastava to make her presentation. Over to Professor Sivastava. Ma'am, first we'll go to Tribunat, sir. Yeah. Ma'am, first we'll go to uh, Ambassador uh, Tribunat, sir. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Professor. Yes, Ambassador. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Patel uh, and uh, the distinguished panelists, and thank you to uh, FES and IMPRI for organizing uh, this program. Uh, it is a given that uh, this is an extremely important and much less talked about uh, issue that we need to deal with. Uh, especially in the foreign policy, because foreign policy is nothing but an extension of your domestic policy in the larger international scenario. 
you may have read today, there were two items that attracted my attention in the newspapers. One was that the Supreme Court issued a judgment, which is sort of a landmark in many ways, in which it talks about the, basically the, the right to terminate pregnancy by a woman, married or unmarried, which is a major challenge, major change. It castigates women, basically. But the other one, which was a worse kind of a thing, was a comment by a lady IAS officer in Bihar uh, when some young women asked about the availability of various items. The insensitive comment, frankly, coming from a lady officer really leaves a lot to be desired at the grassroots level. So I know that this is a, a problem as far as foreign. So what I will try to do is today say a bit from my practical experience uh, in the foreign service, exactly how this has happened over time. Uh, I, I know many would have touched upon during this period, but let me try to recalibrate that what are we going to essentially do about this whole thing? So most important thing is uh, as a community uh, of people who are trying to incite some debate and try to arrive at some kind of informed decision-making, it is important to understand that it is necessary to respond to the discrimination and systematic uh, subordination that characterizes everyday life. So it is absolutely important that we do not be a part of it. We, do, we have to be a part of the voice against it. Then we need to create a gender equality rather than, or, or integrating that very idea, rather than talking about men, women, female, there was an earlier, I've been associated with some groups that have come out with certain reports in which I had a question. I said, listen, I mean, we are looking at all the time that there should be more women. If there are more women in the system, uh, they should have greater representation, greater responsibility. Then perhaps that will be, that will address uh, the major issue. But frankly, if you see that we have had prime ministers who were women, we have a president who have been, even current one is the president. We have a foreign minister who was a woman. We have a foreign secretaries who are women. We are currently, for the first time, we have a permanent representative, Indian permanent representative, uh, a woman ambassador to Chirak Ambuch for the first time. What I thought would be important to study and understand, and now, of course, there may be a, a ministers of state, there are many of them, and we have finance minister, whatnot. So it has to be an integrated kind of mindset. Let us try to probably analyze having a woman in the leadership position, has it helped the cause of the women or cause of their representation? And to what extent, if it is so? Now, being at the top position, one cannot say that that person is being, you know, subjected to some kind of a discrimination. The problem with our political system has been that it has, it is machoist, no doubt. It is male dominated, no doubt. But the politics of gender has continued to play throughout. We have not, we have had the great women who represented India, the great women who've been our leaders, but at the same time, at the grassroots level, that problem continues. So we have to promote peace, security, development, and involvement of the women in thought so that they do not suffer under any uh, kind of a scenario that, is, uh, that, that we face on a daily basis. No one can argue about it, that this should be the case. There should be a greater focus and participation for women and gender-centric and sensitive approaches. <clears throat> we see Afghanistan in our neighborhood. We have Taliban, which has taken over. And who gave Taliban the power today? We need to look at it. This is United States of America, which signed a deal with Taliban knowing too well what is their aggressive philosophy and politics is all about. And then you expect them to give rights to the women. So we have to see the two ends of the spectrum when we are looking at this other thing next we see in Iran. What is happening about the hijab? What is the role of the morality police in these countries as if nothing else there? So there is no death of these kind of uh, the problems that are pertaining all over in the international policy domain. 
Now, a country like India could definitely be a beacon in this, should be a beacon in this, in my view, because we used to believe in something called Ramante Tatra Devta Yatranaristu Pujante, or the, the all to these days it's Navratri, and we are seeing we are all the time worshiping Lord God, Goddess Durga, and we are talking about these things. But in the reality, very often we are not prepared at the grassroots level uh, to be able to see the women in the position of power. You will know, probably you might be knowing that this year in the Indian Civil Services, once again, a lady has topped the exam. In India, foreign service, we used to have one very famous lady and who stood up to this male kind of a domination. And that was Miss Muthamma, the very first Indian ambassador. Initially, she was dissuaded from joining the foreign service, but then eventually she came. But it took her till 1979 when she was ignored for the post of foreign secretary to go to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court really spoke about the kind of discrimination and the apartheid or misogynistic approach of the foreign office that was prevailing at the time. We have had Nirupma Rao foreign secretary, Sujata Singh, uh, and there were three foreign secretaries so far. We might have more. So we probably, it'll be a good idea to look at it. Let me just give you a little flavor about what used to be uh, the, mm, the kind of entitlements uh, for in the, in the foreign office at the time when I joined service. For the single women, it was very difficult in the sense they were going with their family. And even among the officers, husband and wife, a very simple, small thing I tell you is that if the husband gets full foreign allowance, the wife used to get 50% of the allowance if both of them are officers between one of the two. Similarly, if a many man or woman, whatever it is, the, the officer gets two pillows it could be so stupid and uh, <laughs> that, uh, whereas the, uh, the, the spouse will get only one. So, so these are the smallest possible uh, problems which were engineered into the rules that basically uh, prevailed at the time. We did not have any uh, system whereby the women, if they were feeling at any level, they were feeling uh, some injustice done to them that they could go to. Today we have that, that there are women led uh, systems in which they can go and their the addressal is done. We have also heard about uh, the, the foreign minister recently, he was confronted last year, I think, and he asked and he said, we support it. And you'll be surprised that recently one of the foreign, foreign service batches that passed out, one of the officers who got the best uh, essay, I mean, they have to write a paper, was on this particular dimension, the foreign policy. So I have always believed that we need to, we need to do, we are in the UNSC, we have tried to raise the issues there. And as you know, I mean, it is very well known and I think others have spoken or, or probably will speak again, is that when the first time this uh, human rights were being defined, it was man's right. It was not, it was Hansa Mehta who rose up and he put a foot down and finally it became the human right of the world, not the all men are born equal. So this is something that we have started as long ago as we can look at it. Then we had the first ambassador of Vijay Lakshmi Pandit. She was, but she of course coming from a very uh, elite background, one can say so. But today again, uh, we have uh, a, a young lady, very smart uh, woman who are there uh, fielding everybody and doing an exemplary job. So there is no question about the women's uh, competence levels, there is no question about this, but I am simply sometimes wonder exactly how within the system, can you provide them a greater role? Who should provide them the greater role? What kind of a role they are looking that they are being denied at least in the foreign office, Indian foreign office. I have not come across in my, at least last 20 years, where the women have not been uh, overlooked to become an ambassador. Very often they are provided uh, better postings compared to their male colleagues, which is sort of a hard burn sometimes. We have seen the women now, even the air attaches, like women have become in the diplomatic missions when they are posted there. Today, they are willing to take on responsibility in any part of the world, and they are ready to go there. And that is what provides them sort of equality of opportunity. But we are not looking only at the, <clears throat> at the women only at the ambassadorial level or the senior positions. 
what we need to do it also, there are a large number of uh, the people who are working under, the, under them in a non-executive capacities. They don't have much scope of growth. Now that is very important and where do they go? But this is, the system is so uh, made in such a way that you have to have an escalator approach. There is no other, unless we try to create some kind of a, um, to, to, uh, some kind of a quota based system whereby there should be an, an X, amount, X percentage of the intake of the foreign service officers who are young women and then take them forward. And that should be applied at all levels. So you have a critical mass of let's say 40, 50% uh, of, the, of, the, of the women in the foreign service, if we are going to look at that. So that's one way to look at it. We cannot replicate what happened in Sweden, Canada or elsewhere. Mexico is also very different because of their social cultural uh, dimensions, but they have shown the way. They have spoken about three hours and all kinds of uh, the things that we have talked about or are reading it about it. We have to also change our mindset. I have had at least five women bosses in my career. And I have also seen that there is absolutely uh, no problem whatsoever having a, a, a female boss. Of course, I have also seen that in, uh, in certain countries like Arab countries or for that matter in, um, in uh, Russia itself, it is very difficult for a, for a lady ambassador to operate in that kind of an environment where the mindset is very different uh, in those countries. So there is an inherent disadvantage also uh, because of the, those countries' um, continuous uh, adherence to their own male chauvinist uh, ideas or ideologies. So they, they, they will respect you, they will meet you, they'll be very nice to you, but you might have a problem in succeeding as far as the job performance is concerned sometimes into the larger domain also. So that is an inherent thing that is the art uh, that, that is available at the level of uh, uh, international level in different countries, and that is there. So today we have about 18% uh, of the ambassadors, and I hope they will continue to grow uh, at, a, at, a, at a much greater rate. And it has been said earlier that there are in India's, even though the gender gap or the gender index, we have gone down probably 112th, 115th, whatever it is. But the idea is that we also had about 16 female chief ministers in different countries, in different states in India. So in the, at the panchayat level, we have a very large number of women who are there. So when we are looking at the domestic policy and domestic policy being the reflection of the foreign policy, I think we can do. In my view, uh, I do not wish to see that there should be a great differentiation or an immense focus on that if you don't do the security related job or which you call as cushy jobs held by the men, uh, that there is any specific discrimination in that sense of the term. What I feel is that India's biggest strength in its foreign policy is its soft power projection. It is, the, it is what it is. In the real hard power, the, there is really a greater contestation with different bigger powers or stronger powers. But as far as the soft power is concerned, that's where I think that the role of the women is extremely important. And soft power means what I'm talking about is we provide capacity building assistance to 161 countries in the world. We are the, perhaps the biggest in that sense as far as the expense of it is concerned. Now, what can we do in that? In my view, India can do is be a Agent, agent of change. It can try to say that we are going to provide assistance to the countries that will have at least 50% of the, uh, the, the benefits going to the women. We are going to give, if we are giving 50,000 scholarships to Africans, we can say, okay, at least 25,000 must be given to the women. That is in our hands. We don't require any great change at the political level or any uh, constitutional change. That is our assistance that we give, and we could start working on that. We can learn from the good practices or best practices from, let's say, Sweden. I have served in Sweden, and I have seen that it's not that easy. You have just seen that uh, the, the, the female prime minister there was there hardly for a year and has been moved by some other. We are, but on the other hand, we are seeing what is happening in Italy and other places. Now, will they be focusing on the women's rights? That is something they need to see. My idea is that this charity begins at home. 
that should be the one thing that they should continue to do that without sign sounding uh, feminist in that sense of the term. So this is, there are many things that we can do at the grassroots level within the country. We can do a lot outside the country. I would also like to just touch upon one point before I close, which is not talked about. In the foreign service, the role of the spouse is extremely important. They do conduct more than 50% of the foreign policy by way of spreading goodwill, talking to that community service initiatives at, and in a very graceful manner. And that has not yet been recognized by the foreign, foreign service or the foreign policy establishment. But that is an extremely important uh, dimension that we need to do. I am not a great one for the, uh, for the um, reservations in services uh, personally, because it leads to a very different kind of a mindset. But in this gender related matter, I'm all for it. And if we can somehow change it that 40 to 50% people are, must be from the, uh, among the, from among the women, I think that will give you an immediately, uh, 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 take it up forward as we are going to face new world, which will be driven, AI driven, industrial revolution 4.0, in which of course, climate change, energy security, internet, all kinds of cyberspace, intellectual property, et cetera. These are all going to be the major things. So I'll stop here, but I would like to wish you all the very best and we'll be happy to answer any specific questions. Uh, there is a lot that needs to be done. And I can just say that one of my colleagues, uh, former ambassador Lakshmi Puri had actually written a big paper uh, in which she had many years ago spoken about six gunas. So I think those are six ways to go move forward in the foreign policy domain. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Honorable Ambassador Anil Trigunayat, uh, you made a very, very important points and, uh, the, and insider stories that you gave. I think that is very encouraging because you talked about the escalator approach, which we feminists call it affirmative action for the historical injustices which the civilization has made when it comes to women. And you also talked about the critical mass theory, and we have very good experience of critical mass approach for so far as the Panchayati Raj institution, local self-government bodies in urban and rural areas are concerned. And I think same thing can happen. It will change the ecosystem. And we saw even in the European Union, 40% of uh, women par parliamentarians are there. That has completely changed the whole culture uh, in the parliamentary debates in European Union. Your point about soft power and also capacity building exercise for one 65 uh, countries. I think that's a very, very important opportunity about which not uh, so far we have not heard or nothing is much written about it, that how can we become agent of change and also uh, uh, studying and learning from the best practices in the countries where they have a very robust for, for policy. Uh, feminist foreign policy and I think your uh, uh, forecast about the future that what uh, how we are going to be in the 21st century knowledge economy uh, by the heavy uh, artificial intelligence industry 4.0 intellectual property regime in that we have to prepare ourselves and also uh, uh, your your uh, emphasis on that uh, you support the affirmative action you say reservation that there has to be critical minimum then only we can change the scenario. So thank you very much. And uh, would you like to have question immediately or we can have other presentations. And after that, you will leave at 5.30, no? We have one. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. If there's any question, I'll be happy to take it now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Are there any questions, participants? You can either write or you can unmute yourself and ask the questions. The floor is open for the participants. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Abdullah and then Dr. Tanuja Sachdev. First, Dr. Abdullah. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, the organizers of this uh, wonderful mm -hmm. webinar. I congratulate uh, Ambassador Ariel. Please and introduce yourself, sir. Yeah. My name is Abdullah Ibrahim Salahuddin from uh, Kwara State University, Maliti. Uh, award the uh, class university. Uh, I'm here to just uh, make a kind of observation which I've been raising right from the beginning of this webinar. I have been trying to capitalize on the, uh, on the necessity 
of uh, considering the uh, socio-cultural diversity in addressing the issue of uh, gender equality and justice. I've been raising this uh, question or observation repeatedly, which uh, in case of in India, as uh, our eminent ambassador has uh, contributed, uh, having five female bulls, 18% uh, of the uh, ambassador uh, and 15% of the uh, ministers across the uh, India states uh, does not justify this equality of uh, equality, I mean, gender equality. I specifically want to make reference to the diversity in cultural and the culture of different countries, which we need to consider vividly if we are to give accurate uh, uh, or if we, are, if we have to address the issue in the point of justice. Uh, the issue of uh, Taliban, I mean, Taliban in Afghanistan that was uh, raised by uh, Ambassador, you will discover that the background and the culture and especially the, 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 the religion uh, history of Taliban affects their relationship or their understanding of gender equality. So that is where I've been referring to right from the beginning of the webinar that can't we have an, an holistic approach to the standard of the female roles in the international policy? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Can we take second question also? And then, uh, yeah, then I'm just the sir can end. Respond. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm Tanuja and I teach in Delhi University. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, like Professor Vibhuti Patel has stated, um, you know, that you've shared very valuable insights about <clears throat> uh, the position of women IFS officers. My question is, um, you know, about the leadership, when we talk about women IFS officers, um, they function as male IFS officers. It is the way they function. And which is true of women, you know, leadership all over the world, whether they function as, you know, whether they're presidents or prime ministers or MPs, all of them function in a particular manner. So women foreign service officers function in a similar, in a similar manner. Uh, my question is um, whether in your experience, you have noticed that foreign women officers had a, have a different approach to dealing with matters uh, related to diplomacy. You know, that would be a very interesting insight. Uh, are they able to bring <clears throat> a different approach to conducting diplomacy? So far, we talk about numbers that we have, you know, ambassadors and secretaries, which is true for all areas of uh, government, whether it's India or, you know, it is universal. It is the approach to diplomacy. It is the approach to leadership. In your opinion, have you seen, um, you know, a difference in the way they have uh, dealt with matters of diplomacy? You know, where, where you would remark that this is something a feminist would do. And mind you, a feminist approach can be carried out even by male officers. So yeah. we didn't talk about women and men, but a feminist yeah. approach, and this is something uh, that has bothered me right through the uh, discussions we've had the last, uh, you know, the whole month, that there's a feminist approach towards the functioning of institutions and processes. And um, it is here, gender has to be reconceptualized as a category of analysis. The focus has to be on uh, institutions, processes, uh, the manner these processes are conducted. So a male could be feminist as well. Correct. I, I wonder if I made sense. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. thank you. Yeah. Thank you, well, Dr. Well, I think there is a third question also by Mr. Prakash Almeida. It is in the same uh, 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 thread. So I think let him also make presentation, then you can answer. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Prakash Almeida, please unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you for uh, this uh, great learning experience. 
uh, uh, sir very rightly pointed out uh, uh, about that insensitive remark of that IS officer. Uh, my question is, how do you see the success of the United Nations in securing women's rights um, in the whole context that you talk about the foreign policy? And uh, uh, another thing is, when we talk about, um, you know, uh, vested interests, you know, there are no permanent uh, friends or enemies, there are permanent national interests. In this situation, how do we secure the, uh, the rights of women, which are in fact universal? You cannot limit them to India. But at times, um, you know, uh, things are not uh, good in uh, Afghanistan. We see how child labor uh, and all those things and the state of women. But we are restricted somewhere because of a uh, narrow national interest. How do we handle all this? Currently, even in Iran, I would like to add. Yes, yes. Things are happening. Yeah, we have to keep also, mum at times. Prakashji also introduced yourself. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir, please. Yeah, Mr. thank you. Yeah, Mr. Um, for the first question by Mr. Abdul, Abdullah is the, uh, it's a very interesting thing that very often we tend to obfuscate uh, saying that uh, everything is part of the socio-cultural milieu and uh, diversity that exists, no doubt about it. Uh, but there are, there, is, there are certain facts that at least 50% of the population of any country, any society, any religion happens to be women. We all respect them when they are mothers, we respect them when they are sisters, but there has to be a societal a letter that needs to be created for them to express their viewpoints. And uh, whether it is couched under religion, even in, it is not only a particular to uh, Islam or others, but even in Hinduism, there were uh, many uh, times, if you read Manu Smarthi, sometimes that you will find things that uh, tend to look back at women. But at the same time, we have where we make the look at the women as, uh, as uh, compare them to the God, because the mother is, if they say that if you educate a woman, you educate a family, you educate a man, you educate one person. That's so I think that yes, cultural diversity is important. So therefore, the approach or the objective for empowering women to do something. I mean, I have always believed that leave them alone, they will do much better. But the problem is that the male dominated system tries to stunt their growth, does not allow them. They are not looking to be worshipped like we say in Indian system, uh, or for that matter, just very hello words uh, which come out. What we need to see is that they have the greatest potential and they have proved them again and again and again, including in the security area. When India posted it's under the United Nations Security Council resolution in Liberia, there were Indian policewomen who were sent and they were being just very recently again uh, awarded. So wherever they have gone, even in the security domain, have been very successful. So my idea is we may to create an ecosystem is a bright idea, is a desirable idea. But who will create that ecosystem? The interested parties won't. So interested party in this case, uh, though those who are controlling the stakes. So therefore, uh, we, we, how much can we expect? So you have to continue to become a social, uh, uh, some kind of a societal uh, uh, movement here? like this one, which will continue. So that's what I'm saying. We have to, charity begins at home. That's what I said. And each one of us need to work in a, in a field so that uh, there is a greater knowledge about it. Well, as far as Professor uh, Tanuja said, uh, is absolutely correct. I think that we need a different approach. As far as India's foreign policy and how the women handle it, I would say that uh, there are two, two dimensions to it. One, I can actual case, I can say I will not name the person. <clears throat> when posted in a senior, very senior position in a country, I can name Russia. They found it was very difficult to do what they wanted to do in terms of access to essentially the male dominated system or in Arab world for that matter, or in Persia or other places. It is a bit difficult for the women to adjust and what Professor Muhammad Abdullah said was correctly that socio-cultural milieu is so different that you just cannot go out and sit at the coffee and keep sitting for a long time, Arabic and drinking and then talking like that. So that's a limitation. But at the same time, I can tell you that whenever uh, I, I, I have several bosses I've had, and whenever you go with them 
to discuss in the foreign ministry everywhere uh, or in the local governments you find or the overall approach to the uh, to, to the issues that are at hand uh, is far more i would say sympathetic is milder which actually gives a greater credence to the sincerity of your approach so that is definitely a characteristic that is there we def there is, you cannot uh, say that everybody behaves in a certain manner uh, or they have but this is basically on our upbringing it is also true that foreign policy in its content is the, or ob objectives in a country serving national interest and all could be perhaps a gender neutral dimension we need not look at it from a male or female foreign policy but what we need to look at is that this is something that objective is given given to all ambassadors irrespective of that so what you rightly mentioned is that 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 is very important that what this is job given to you so if you are in the uh, if you are on the border and you are a, a fighting force then obviously you don't see you only see the enemy so it's like this abroad you do that similarly on the capacity building programs i have seen that the women just bring about a much better connectivity uh, with the with the broader masses and if they they have that thing so that gives them some kind of a charisma uh, i would say and that helps and which is a very good thing thirdly <clears throat> mr prakash mentioned about the success of un uh, in the women empowerment or women related cases well what we are talking about is because there was a big session i believe here in which all the issues were talked about the un i mentioned about hansa mehta's case it was in the un when they were talking about all men are born equal then she said what do you mean by all men or women are not born equal so they had to make amends there so the very fundamental thing has changed then peacekeeping women are at the center of it women children and disadvantaged communities in the internationally uh, internally and internationally displaced persons so i think that everywhere there is a focus now does the un have uh, resources and enough resources to do that that is a questionable thing whether it has been able to do, to do justice to it then the un women women organization which is totally focused on this aspect but whether they have got resources to be able to execute what they want to do is a is a bigger question and that applies in the overall performance of the united nations which is less than satisfactory thank you thank you ambassador anil tirgunayan for making such an important example, uh, intervention and also uh, giving us so many important examples based on your personal experience as well as the uh, collective wisdom which the indian foreign service has uh, acquired after 75 years of negotiating with other different countries now i request professor meena shivastava to make her presentation uh, over to professor meena shivastava Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Patel, um, and thank you to Dr. Uh, to to Ambassador Trigunayat for that presentation and uh, responses to questions. Uh, um, I, I apologize for um, <laughs> for how I must be looking right now because I, it is three a.m. my time, a um, little bit later now. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it's my pleasure to be here uh, and, and talk to you virtually about this really important issue. Uh, and thank you, first of all, to FES and, uh, and IMPRI for organizing this web policy talk series. I would like to first begin by acknowledging that I'm located in the unceded Coast Salish territory, home to the Vasanic people, in whose traditional territories I live on and work from my home office for Athabasca University, which is located on Treaty 6, the traditional territory of the Plains Cree, Woodland Cree, Beaver Cree, Soto, Nisitapi, Métis, and the Nakota Sioux people. In Canada, land and territorial acknowledgements are political statements that respectfully recognize Indigenous peoples' historical relationships and continued presence on the lands where we as settlers live and work and benefit from. They are reminders of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action to redress historical and contemporary injustices toward the indigenous peoples of these lands. Today, September 30th, is marked in Canada as the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation 
to honor the children who never returned home and survivors of residential schools, as well as their families and communities. In its emphasis on diverse histories, ways of knowing, ways of living, and calls for solidarity and social justice, the notion of the land acknowledgement and the public commemoration and acknowledgement of the painful history of residential schools has overlaps with feminist insights. Feminist and related interventions teach us that our unique sets of identities based on ethnicity, class, religion, gender, sexuality, nationality, ability, status, etc., affect our social and political experiences and their outcomes. We also experience our positionality differently in different contexts, depending on where we stand in relation to the existing dynamics of power and privilege. So in terms of my positionality, as a critical political economist, I'm very well aware that my class and caste privileges have played a significant role in ensuring the portability of my experience and advantages, and thus my ability to move through spaces. After finishing my doctorate in international studies from Jawaharlal Nehru University, I began my decade long academic career in South Africa, immediately following its transition from an apartheid police state to a democracy. For the past 16 years, I have lived and worked in Canada during a pe period of acknowledgement and conciliation with its colonial history. My positionality then as an able-bodied cisgender woman who deals with chronic pain, an academic of color, and an immigrant from a formerly colonized country informs my research approaches and teaching methods, as well as the focus of my academic writing and creative works. Broadly, next slide, please. Broadly, my research examines political processes affecting the conceptualization and manifestation of globalization, which I see as a process along a historical continuum of global movements of humans, ideas, institutions, commodities, and technologies. My research publications and teaching thus involve themes as varied as dimensions of globalization, global history, international trade relations, environmental management and politics, critical theory, democracy studies, and women and gender studies. All collect, connected through the thread of the political economy of our relentlessly globalizing world. Given my academic background in literature, history, international relations, and political economy, my research methodology is largely interdisciplinary and coincides with my teaching interest in the emergence of new issue areas in international political economy and the challenges they pose to established paradigms. This personal and academic background will inform my talk today that highlights the significance of applying a gender lens to the theories and practices of international relations and diplomacy. Next slide, please. Although, as we know, women comprise half of the human population, we know that women's near complete absences from international relations theory and practice is certainly not new. This absence is manifested both in women's marginalization from decision-making and in the assumption that the reality of women's day-to-day -day lives is not impacted by or important to international relations. These long-standing exclusions have not only shaped our current political systems domestically and internationally, but also how we understand and analyze them. What is new though, is the growing acceptance of insights from feminist research, which has demonstrated the value of women's experiences and contributions, and also demonstrated how international relations rests on and perpetuates gendered ideas about who does what, what experiences, um, who experiences what and why in global politics. Beyond this, Feminist theory also challenges the notion that gender and IR are two separate spheres that do not impact on each other 
or their traditional international relations is gender neutral. On the contrary, feminist theory has shown that traditional IR is in fact gender blind, which allows the discipline to ignore women's agency in political, economic, social, and historical processes, along with structural disadvantages that prevent us from moving forward. In understanding the contributions of feminism to IR, it's very important to recognize though, that despite its designation, feminism does more than just focus on women or on what are considered as women's issues. In highlighting both inequality and relations of power, feminism reveals gendered power and how it affects global politics. In its explorations of the tools of gendered inequality and the construction of gendered identities, feminism goes beyond the homogenous concept of women in international relations. Not all gender considerations rest on the analysis of women, nor should they. <clears throat> as gender can be defined as socially constructed assumptions related to behavior, appearances, etc. cetera. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm missing my space here. I'll just quickly take a sip of water, sorry. <clears throat> Excuse me. That are assigned to either male or female bodies. Feminist scholarship thus takes both women and gender seriously by exposing gendered logics as powerful organizing frameworks. And in doing so, it challenges international relations, foundational concepts and assumptions. For instance, an early contribution of feminist theories made violence against women visible in an international system that tacitly accepted gendered violence as a normal state of affairs. Gender research demonstrated the links between violence against women in the private sphere and the kinds of violence people, women experience in public, in an increasingly globalized political economy, as well as in times of war. In short, no way do women and non-binary people or people marginalized due to ethnicity, class, caste, disability, and location share the same economic, political, social, or bodily rights as men. And everywhere, there are prevalent forms of gendered violence, whether it be violence in private and in public spaces or in zones of conflict. In looking at violence against women and gendered communities in such a way, it is possible to see a continuum of gendered violence that does not reflect the neat categories of peace, stability, and conflict in traditional international relations. So for many societies thought of as predominantly peaceful or stable may yet have high levels of violence against a particular portion of the population. This perspective then presents a very different image of peace and conflict from the one viewed through the lens of the security interests of the states in traditional IR. Next slide, please. In making women visible, Feminism has also highlighted women's absence from decision-making and institutional structures. Traditional perspectives that ignore gender not only overlook the contributions of women and the impact global politics has on them, but also perpetually justify their exclusion. If women are outside these domains of power, then their experiences and contributions are not relevant. The accompanying chart is an example of how we measure the presence <clears throat> and significance of women's contributions, the bulk of which remains invisible, unpaid, and unacknowledged in the form of social reproductive behavior. The expansion of the scope of traditional international relations has enabled scholars to emphasize how the international political and economic systems are fashioned by complex intertwined relationships and practices of everyday life and not just by inst international institutions or elites. In this broadened conception, we see the spaces of the mundane, the everyday and the intimate as inherent parts of the constitution and reproduction of and resistance to the global political and economic structures. Moreover, expanding what counts as political or economic 
also enables us to see things that truly matter in the lived experience of real world subjects. The influence of things such as gender, ethnicity, location, and histories, for instance. As feminists, anti-racist, post-colonial, and other scholars have argued for many decades, by assuming that these influences are peripheral rather than central, too many scholars in international relations have failed to grasp many of the key patterns and problems that confront us today. Feminist theories have thus worked to demonstrate that this definition, uh, this distinction between the private and the public is false. In doing so, they show that these previously excluded areas are central to the functioning of international relations, even if they are not acknowledged. And that the exclusion and inclusion of certain areas in traditional IR thinking is based on gendered ideas of what counts and what does not count. This brings us to the second key contribution of feminism exposing and deconstructing socially constructed gender norms. In making sense of international relations in a way that takes both women and gender seriously, feminism has demonstrated the construction of gendered identities that perpetuate normative ideas of what men and women should do. These socially constructed gender identities also determine the distributions of power which impact where women are in global politics. So where are the women? Next slide, please. In her 1989 book, Bananas, Beaches and Bases, Cynthia Enloe asked the question, where are the women? Encouraging international relations scholars to see the spaces that women inhabit in global politics by deconstructing the distinctions between what is considered international and what is considered personal. She showed how global politics impacts and is impacted by the daily activities of men and women, and in turn, how these activities rest on gendered identities. For instance, the military and war making uh, has, have been traditionally seen as masculine endeavors linked with the idea that men are warriors and protectors and they are the legitimate armed actors who fight to protect those in need of protection, women, children, and non-fighting men. In practice, this has meant that the many ways that women contribute to conflict and experience conflict have been considered peripheral or outside the realm of IR's considerations. It is hardly surprising then that the mass rape of women during and after the Second World War was ignored as an unfortunate byproduct of war, and that it was only in 2002 that the Rome Statute recognized rape as a war crime. This belated recognition, nevertheless, has not led to the curtailment of conflict-related sexual violence, which remains endemic in many conflict zones around the world. Feminism that then, has not only exposed gender violence and women's marginalization in global politics, it has also challenged gendered constructions of women as inherently peaceful, in need of protection, or as victims. The construction of gendered identities veils the diversity of women's engagement with IR, and in practice, it perpetuates women's limited access to power. These gendered constructions occur at the intersections of other forms of identity, such as ethnicity, race, class, caste, and others. This highlights the importance of intersectionality, understanding that IR is shaped not only by gender, but also by these other identities. Intersectionality refers to where these identities intersect, and in turn, how different groups of people are marginalized suggesting that we must consider each in tandem rather than in isolation. Consciously applying a gender lens then does not only address the historical marginalization of women, it also provides a more complete picture of global politics by taking into account a much broader range of actors and actions. Next slide, please. Building peace and resolving pe conflict continues to be the central concern of international relations scholars, 
especially as conflicts become broader and more complex in the context of the challenges of declining democracy in the climate crisis era. Given our understanding of structural and indirect violence against women, non-binary and other gendered communities, restrictions on their access to basic resources such as food, housing, education, and health services makes them more susceptible to various forms of gendered violence. The dominant approach to keeping peace continues to ignore issues like gendered violence, which are considered soft issues as opposed to the hard or real issues of military security. This understanding of peace then ignores the security of more than half of the population of any society. In the year 2000, Resolution 1325 of the United Nations Security Council reaffirmed the important role of women in the prevention and resolution of conflict and in post-conflict reconstruction, stressing the importance of women's equal participation in all efforts for the maintenance and promotion of peace and security. Unfortunately, women have not only remained significantly underrepresented in all types of international negotiations. In 2015, a United Nations whistleblower exposed reports of sexual abuse of women and children in the Central African Republic by peacekeepers and the United Nations in action in the face of these reports. This is in keeping with the feminist characterization of the current international system in which militarized security and the coherence of the institution is prioritized over the welfare of gendered individuals and communities. The same year, former Swedish Foreign Affairs Minister Margot Walsam popularized the concept of a feminist foreign policy or feminist diplomacy. <clears throat> Built on the premise of equal representation of women in politics, business and society, or the three R's, uh, resource representation and rights, its practice can take the form of placing more women into government positions and approving funds earmarked for feminist projects abroad. This approach, as we have heard, has found flavor, favor in efficient foreign policies of countries such as Canada, France, Germany, Spain, Netherlands, Mexico, et cetera. These countries from the global North appeal to ethical and moral principles such as democracy and human rights in defining and conducting their foreign policies beyond national borders in the spirit of cosmopolitanism and post-sovereignty. Nevertheless, feminist foreign policy aims to improve women's conditions around the world within the existing growth-oriented economic system as highlighted by the recurring references to the sustainable development goals. Within its framework, Gender equality is seen as a means to reach the goal of economic growth. In a similar vein, rather than fighting international insecurity to improve gender equality, in this conception of gender equality, it is seen as a tool for the improvement of global security. But how is this narrative received and perceived in the global South, especially in post-conflict countries, the purported recipients of the feminist foreign policy approach. Next slide, please. <clears throat> a recent study of 20 countries affected by conflict notes that the foreign, feminist foreign policy narratives have been accompanied by strategic silences in the media coverage within these post-colonial countries. The media in conflict affected states was analyzed as the space where different strategic narrative stages, such as projection by foreign policy actors and reception by local editors and journalists coexisted. The study observed that when covered by the local media of conflict affected states, most of the strategic narratives of foreign policy actors was reproduced or echoed without any scrutiny or analysis of local implications. This coverage reinstates countries and individuals in the global South as merely being recipients of international norms until 
we pay attention to the strategic silences. Examining the gendered silences in the local public sphere from a post-colonial perspective reveals deeper insights into the apparent disengagement with the feminist foreign policy narrative of powerful foreign policy actors. A post-colonial logic implies that while colonialism is officially over, its practices continue on both in material and ideational forms. The post-colonial logic can thus result in disengagement with the strategic narratives of foreign policy actors as a form of indirect resistance. This can happen in speech by letting the local representatives echo rather than scrutinize the content of strategic narratives of foreign policy actors in the media, or it can happen in silences by avoiding any coverage of these narratives. The factors for these silences in post-colonial countries are varied and complex and cannot just be reduced to being a stand against gender equality and empowerment or culture and whatever. Do they reflect a deeply divided society that is yet to heal from violent trauma? Are these silences directed against capitalist growth and resource extraction, especially given that increasing women's participation in the labor market has been viewed as contributing to the profits of multinational corporations rather than benefiting local people? Or do these silences demonstrate the resistance to Euro-American centrism, which forces local communities to translate their life and worldviews to align with foreign strategic narratives to make them intelligible to the audience in the global North? These are some of the questions that we must ask when we consider the evolution and impact of international norms, such as feminist foreign policy. Moreover, just getting more women into positions of power in public diplomacy, the military and civil service, etc., does not necessarily translate into serving the interests of women or other marginalized groups. Consider the policies pursued by the many women leaders in politics and business who actively participate in the creation of re re repressive hegemonies detrimental to other women. Consider too the same countries that avow feminist foreign policy, but continue to increase defense spending and are some of the largest suppliers of arms to the most regressive regimes in the world that violate basic human rights. In the contemporary international system then, there are many examples of countries promoting an ethical foreign policy while not fully abiding by its principles at home or abroad. To address these contradictions in the theory and practice of feminist foreign policy, we need to go back to the transformative understanding of feminism, especially now. Next slide, please. <clears throat> A feminist foreign policy approach needs to be consistent with the gendered understanding of peace and security mentioned earlier. By equating feminism only with the situation of women and girls, this approach overlooks the impact of globalization on structural inequalities for all genders. Particularly in the global South, these inequalities are perpetuated by the practices of multinational corporations, natural resource extraction, and the global care industry, to name a few examples. By not addressing the gendered impact of globalization, feminist foreign policy fails to be transformative as it only manages the situation of some women and girls within the existing system of international power relations. This superficial approach is particularly inadequate in the context of the ongoing disruptions of the pandemic and the climate crisis as they pose momentous challenges to the international economic, political, and ecological systems. Concurrently, we are also witnessing the persistent tide of autocratic regimes and hyper-nationalism accompanied by the mobilization of people around the world to protest the injustices of political and economic systems 
in which the lives of people marginalized by gender, religion, ethnicity, class, caste, disability, sexuality, and location are systematically devalued. These interconnected trends pose profound challenges to existing disciplinarily based analytical approaches and demand new forms of interdisciplinarity and innovative forms of research. Responding to these contemporary challenges, the scope of inter traditional international relations has expanded to emphasize not only the interactions of sovereign states and other international actors, but also the implications of complex intertwined relations uh, and practices of the personal and the local. This broadened conception of IR would not have been possible without feminist insights, which have highlighted the role of norms and identities, and thus provided new conceptual tools to understand the forces shaping globalization and their variegated impact on diverse peoples. Feminist interventions are often located within the ongoing debates on diversification and decolonization, which advocate for recentering the diverse voices of humanity in the construction of power as well as knowledge. The importance of feminism thus lies in creating equal gender rights as well as in making the oppressed people heard more and become more visible to the society. Utilizing the overlapping gender ecological and decolonial perspectives then not only reveals the much more complex systems of interconnected deep structures that make up international relations, but also creates possibilities of interdisciplinary analysis and creative solutions to the distress and disruptions caused by the interconnected climate, health, security, and economic crisis in an international system that was built on structural socioeconomic inequality and class divisions within and among nations. Next slide, please. I, I realize that feminism has become a bad word for some people, but I think feminism is for everyone. <clears throat> Feminist foreign policy is uh, definitely not a utopian fantasy. We have seen examples of the application of this approach in the successful collaboration of many women's solidarity groups across hostile territories in Serbia, Albania, the West Bank, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, etc., who have been able to make progress, which many men and their governing structures have so far prevented due to the long history of conflict. Another remarkable application of this approach can be seen in the policies adopted by feminist policymakers, such as the mayor of Barcelona, Ada Balano, placing women at the center of all public policies, which has shown that it does not only combat the everyday difficulties faced by women in terms of care, job security, discrimination, um, safety at home or in the streets, but it also resists powerful forces of globalization, such as financialization of housing, while reinventing communities to achieve a space which encourages diversity, equity, and, and accessibility in multiple ways. These examples add to the empirical data, which shows that oppressing women not only hurts women, it also hurts men. Conversely, Women-centered policies benefit everyone in the society. There is clearly a sense of urgency to the need for inclusive and transformative solutions to the wicked problems of our planet. The neoliberal retreat of the state and the global decline of democratic institutions has happened concurrently with the rise of economic globalization and the concentration of capital on a new level that is effectively outside the control of the state machinery. These trends have further widened the rift between peoples and states, exposing the breach between peoples and states' priorities and policies. 
Women, non-binary folks, the poor, the disabled, the ethnic religious minorities in both the global North and the global South are not only bearing a higher burden of the unfolding effects of the pandemic and the climate crisis, as well as extreme inequality, but also a much higher burden of the hidden costs due to pre-existing structural discriminations. In this context, feminist insights and related critical approaches can provide new strategies to address the current challenges of policies and norms. After all, when intersectional feminist women and men design policies, foreign or domestic, it does benefit everyone. Thank you for listening. And I would love to uh, try to answer uh, questions. The last two slides uh, have the list of some of the references uh, for, for this talk, uh, but also a list of some of the papers that I have uh, written uh, over the years that are relevant for this talk. So thanks again for your time. And uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Meenal Srivastava. You really provided a very, very theoretically robust analysis of wide and, and seamlessly interconnected so many complex issues of the global economy, starting from a whole global movement of people and political economy related issues, and also how the globalizing world is resting on the cheapest labor of women from the uh, developing world, post-colonial societies, as well as women of color. And also you have said the traditional international relations, how do they ignore women's agency and how women are facing systemic and structural disadvantages. You have also uh, highlighted that globally there is a declining of democracy and you see a uh, company hypernationalism, which is also backed by the popular masses, which is also further threat to women, and also financialization and how the uh, transnational corporations, they have now become supreme, and the nation states have just become the subsidiary rather than comprador. You don't need a comprador bourgeoisie. You have the nation states which are acting as comprador. So I think this is very important. But one thing that you end with the optimistic note, that the, the, the transformation is possible, but the so organization of society is possible in the feminist vision. You may hate feminism, you may love feminism, but you can't ignore feminism. So that's what emerges from your extremely robust and uh, theoretically uh, very, very powerful presentation that you have made. Thank you very much. Now I request Professor Nilima Srivastava to respond to your intervention. Good afternoon, everyone. At the, out, at the outset, I would like to uh, thank IMPRI for giving me this opportunity to share my views on feminist foreign policy and my uh, and my presentation today will be a recap of what you have been listening and uh, going through from past four sessions on four uh, in last four weeks so uh, basically this will be uh, uh, why what how to implement and what is the stand of India vis-a-vis -vis foreign policy. So can I have the next slide, slide please? Uh, as you all know that in last few decades, women's rights have progressively, be, progressively being recognized as women's, as human rights, which has been also uh, told by the earlier uh, speakers that how initially human rights were considered as man rights and then they were changed to human rights to include all other non-binary as well as women who constitute almost half of the world's population. But despite an increase in the political and economic participation of women, full gender equality is yet to be achieved, although we have been fighting for it for more than 75 years now. And recently, COVID-19 pandemic also brought to uh, the notice of not only feminists, but uh, human rights activists all over the world that women have experienced a disproportionately higher negative impact 
And this is a clear indication that gender equality must be a priority when responding to crisis. And the answer to this uh, particular issue, a crisis, is to inculcate or to adopt a feminist foreign policy as well as at the domestic level also. Next slide, please. So coming to why we should talk about and why we should uh, discuss having feminist political, a feminist foreign policy. Because many studies indicate that if gender equality is not at the center of action taken by way of, first of all, promoting better representation of women in diplomacy and peacekeeping operations, along with making gender and inclusion priorities in response to international crisis, then these policies have a greater impact at the grassroots. It has also been seen that societies where women are treated more equally to their male counterparts, these societies tend to perform better at, better at all levels and are more secure for all the citizens of that particular nation. The next one, please. Now, what does feminist foreign policy entail? Feminist diplomacy or feminist foreign policy basically calls for a state to promote and practice gender equality by ensuring that all women should enjoy their human rights and this should also be exercised through diplomatic relations. To give a concise definition to feminist foreign policy, it can be said that it is a multi-dimensional multi political framework that aims to elevate women's and other marginalized groups' experiences and agency to scrutinize the destructive power of patriarchy, colonization, heteronormativity, capitalism, racism, and militarism that, has also, that was also um, stressed by, by earlier speakers in today's session. The next one, please. Now let's take a look at what is fe uh, feminist foreign policy framework. It is a policy framework of a state that defines its interaction with both the states and not state actors in a matter that prioritizes peace, gender equality, and environmental integrity that, is, that enshrines the overall human rights for all sections of the society. The aim of this framework is to incorporate policies and initiatives to not just control war or look into diplomacy and security, but also to manage and promote visibility of women and other marginalized groups. The, for the feminist foreign policy framework helps in ensuring that women are treated as equals and they enjoy their human rights within international commitments. The next one, please. Now, I will hurriedly go through the key constituents of a good feminist foreign policy. And it starts with the, with the government's purpose of adopting a fem feminist female, a foreign policy. What is the specific context in which the government want to uh, bring in or come up with uh, FFP as it is called, uh, as it is abbreviated as, and what is the objective behind adopting FPP by a particular government in a particular nation state. Then it should also set out a definition of what FFP means for the government of that particular country and the rational, rational values and approaches associated with the 
policy that they want to implement. And most importantly, it is how this is different from business as usual foreign policy. The scope of the policy is also one of the main constituent as to what is the reach or impact of this policy. And it should be clearly spelled out that how reporting will take place vis-a-vis -vis this, vis -vis this policy. And there should be a coordination across agencies and divisions, for example, with respect to defense, diplomacy, trade, and foreign assistance. The other, next one, please. The other key constituents are to mark the outcomes and benchmarks over a period of time. Because until unless the outcomes and benchmarks are, uh, are uh, followed or they are outlined, the policy uh, effect or implementation cannot be monitored. So the state should, uh, the, uh, the policy should state what outcomes the policy seeks to advance and what is the specific timeline for change. Then plan to operationalize should define how and when the policy is going to be implemented and provide an action plan with specific activities and the period of implementation. They should also resor include resources. It can be the staffing or the human resources, the financial resources or infrastructural resources which are required to implement this particular policy and representation and inclusion of all sections of society, specifically and especially women and other marginalized groups. And very importantly, as um, it was also pointed out, that capacity building is also a very, very important constituent of feminist foreign policy, because many of the times the training programs uh, do not incorporate feminist approaches and and that is how they overlook the fem the feminist um, the intervention in the given policy and also very important for any policy implementation is to have a reporting schedule that after implementation how monitoring will take place next slide next slide please uh, i will hurriedly go through this and since it has been talked by my earlier um, panelist also, and in fact, the being the last uh, uh, on the panel gives me the advantage of skipping over some of the slides and also poses a challenge to present something uh, different, useful, and also add to the uh, knowledge of the participants. So here I have added two more components, uh, which is, uh, with rights, resources, and representation, as was already discussed. And I have also here presented that how rights should be, um, uh, should be uh, you know, seen vis-a-vis -vis or should be ensured vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the internal policies of uh, the particular nation, and how social protection should also look into the fact that it leads to uh, gender equality by, by either by way of providing paid leaves or ensuring that there is no violence against women and other sections of the society. Then resources very uh, easily we have been, the feminists have been always talking about gender budgeting, which will ensure that there is, uh, there is enough budget to promote these policies and representation has all, has, must have been talked about in every session that there should be parity and inclusion at all levels of policy implementation. Then the important part, which I would like to emphasize is research and, and reporting. Many a time, rights, resources, and representation takes place, but there is no evidence as to what is happening at the ground level. And there is no dissemination of what is happening and what is the impact and how it can be improved upon. And the reach of such a policy should be applied to which uh, government adopts by applying a gender lens. The next one. So uh, 
uh, if we say that feminist foreign policy rests on three very important pillars, and they are all interrelated with each other to promote human sec uh, security, uh, power structures in a given society have to be challenged. They have to be restructured and they have to be, uh, uh, they have to change according to the latest requirement, socio-political, socio um, according to the socio-political uh, environment of the nation and by applying intersectionality into the whole um, you know, process, one can see that in, uh, feminist foreign policy can be implemented with, with, uh, uh, with a better intention and with a more uh, serious uh, um, uh, and long-term outcomes. The next one. Uh, yes, you. this, uh, thank you so much. Yes, this is a um, uh, presentation of the countries in the world which have adopted feminist foreign policy, starting with Sweden, where we all know in 2015, then Canada came up with feminist international assistance policy of 2017, followed by France, which called it French, uh, feminist diplomacy. And in 2018, uh, the policy was uh, put in place, followed by Mexico in 2020. And then in 2021, suddenly we find that Spain, Libya, Luxembourg, and Germany uh, also came up with their uh, feminist foreign policy. The next one, please. And, and now I will be discussing a few case studies as to show that how uh, in one or two countries uh, this feminist policy have been uh, implemented. In Canada, it is called feminist international assistance policy, and uh, it applies a human right approach to promoting six interlinked areas for action, including environment and climate action. It recognizes the importance of women's active role in conflict prevention and peace building. The policy also mandates that all the programs and policies of Canada should be reviewed through a comparative gender analysis, which is what is, is, the, is, is at the core of feminist approach that until unless we have gender analysis, we won't be able to understand what and what and what happens to women as well as to the other marginal group in any society. So as a result, half of Canadian diplomats are women, including in high ranking positions. And this particular policy positions Canada as a champion for gender equality in its international assistance programming. High funds have also been allocated for a period of 10 years to promote women and girls' health and human rights. The next one, please. Now, in the next slide, I'll be talking about the case study of Sweden, which by now you must have be uh, memorized it was feminism as the pursuit for gender equality. Drawing on the UN resolution on women, peace and security, Swedish model is straightforward. Change is considered on two fronts, women and their voices at higher levels of decision making, and the other one being the application of a gender or inclusive and inclusive lens to the policies. But Sweden's extensive record of arms export seems contradictory to its feminist goals. In the next slide, I, next slide please, I will draw your attention to why India's foreign policy needs a feminist lens. India has also been elected as a non-permanent member of United Nations Security Council. And the country will assume 
the G20 presidency from 1st of December 2022 to 30th November 2023 for a, for a period of one year. So, so by such commitments, India has committed to promoting gender equality, development, and peace. The country has made progress in the area of greater representation of women and in bringing a gender lens to the policy making spaces. But gender report, gender gap report of 2021 shows that India has dropped 28 spots in its ranking. This shall be a big challenge for the country to keep up with the commitments at international levels. The next slide, please. The next slide, please. So in the next slide, I, I am again talking about that, that what difference will it make in India if we adopt a feminist foreign policy. The policy will act as a milestone in setting up a framework for equality, common well-being, and peace. It will also help in modifying the patriarchal social structures and help in restricting the barriers preventing the participation of women and other marginalized groups in policy decision-making. And importantly, by adopting a feminist foreign policy, India would offer an opportunity to create an environment of peace and promote women in building stronger bilateral relationships. In the next slide, I'll be, conclude, I'll be concluding my uh, talk here that UN Women, an inclusive peace and transition initiative reveals that mere inclusion of women at negotiating tables is not enough to achieve gender parity. For this power or level of influence that women wield in such spaces is what truly makes a difference. The implementation of gender dimensions at all levels of foreign policy contributes to a strengthened role and greater representation of women in decision-making mechanisms. A more inclusive foreign policy lens recognizes the emerging threats to a nation and global relationships with an approach that is both progressive and realistic. And to come to the next slide, please, and to talk about India, India is on the cusp of being a critical collaborator to widen the global feminist foreign policy and make it truly inclusive. So this is an opportunate time to engage and shape the emerging discussions around feminist, policy, feminist foreign policy and other gender mainstreaming approaches because of the present geopolitical situation in which India stands, India can offer a unique perspective in shaping existing policy frameworks. The references that I have used for my presentation and if you wish to know more about what I've talked to today, you can visit these websites. And the last one is that I would like to thank you all for listening to me. And I hope to get Am I there? I'm Hello? Hello? Yes, am I there? Yeah, uh, we, we can't see you. Yeah. Okay. And uh, now we can see you. Yes, 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 you are there. You are very much there. Yes. Okay, thank you so much yeah. for 
hearing me out and also uh, i close with this uh, wish that we live in a better world for each one of us and for the coming generations thank you so much once again thank you so much ma'am so bhuti ma'am we can take up questions if anyone yeah yeah, yeah. okay so thank you dr nilima for a very very comprehensive presentation and adding two more elements in the five uh, three r's rights resources and representation from you have added even research and reporting and the uh, need uh, reach that means the all the policies and programs should be implemented judiciously and your case studies were Brought very it. important i think there are so many students of political science and also uh, research scholars and journalists are there for them also it provides food for thought and i think the question of uh, the india's uh, strategic role in the current situation and i think that should not be only about the uh, for the external policy but even for the internal policy lot of yes. soul searching needs to be done thank you very much and now the floor is open for discussion and uh, we, uh, you can ask questions or intervene in response to both the presentations by professor meena shivastava and professor nilima shivastava participants please unmute yourself and speak. and please introduce yourselves before asking the questions thank you yeah yeah yes very Dr. Aparna, ma'am, can you? Yeah. You can go ahead and ask your question. Yeah. Dr. Aparna Chaudhary, are we here? If not, then we can go ahead with Hello. Abdullah Hindi. Please, sir. Yeah. Hello, ma'am. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Please, are you hearing me clearly? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm, Dr. Uh, you can go ahead. Yes, I'm uh, Dr. Abdullah Ibrahim Salahuddin from Nigeria, Kwara State University. Uh, I asked yes. a question, I typed a question expecting the answer. It said, uh, Mr. I was online. I can't, uh, I, I don't know when you answer the question because I'm also, I've been uh, online and following you all this while. The question is that, the question is uh, for the emerging uh, researcher, we would like to have the participatory uh, certificate on this uh, seminar. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think participation certificate will be given to you after you fill up the feed feedback form and it will come after after the uh, this whole session is over. So all those okay. who have taken part in all four sessions and feedback uh, provide the feedback form will automatically get the uh, participation certificate. Now there is a comment by, uh, I think there is a question by Mr. Prakash Almeida. Can you unmute yourself and ask? I think your question is, relevant for both the speakers yes uh, yeah 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 uh, uh, first of all i thank for this two excellent presentation uh, i think we can gloriously remember vijayalakshmi pandit here just uh, you know uh, was the eighth president of the united nations general assembly uh, my question is uh, what are your views on the role of a uh, role and contribution of indian democracy in giving women uh, a level playing field in the distribution of power uh, in general field as well as in international relations and how do you think globalization has impacted feminism and its role in international relations in India? How the scenario is unfolding? Yeah. Yes, Professor Meenal, you can start. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, if I understand that question correctly, you are asking about constitutional provisions uh, for women's rights in India. And yeah. in that, yes, we have one of the most uh, progressive constitutions uh, in the world uh, in terms of uh, ensuring the rights of women, um, you know, uh, as defined. And uh, so I, I, if I understand that question correctly, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, and uh, in terms of globalization, uh, was your question the contribution of women in globalization? Is, was that your question? Uh, no, uh, uh, Indian the question, democracy. Yes, power yes. sharing. Uh, power, power sharing, sharing in India. How it has impacted and globalization, how it is info, uh, unfolding in India today, and its uh, its impact on feminism, and then the role in international relations. 
Okay, so, so I see a lot of different threads in here. This is a very complex issue. And I think that's what we've been talking about this last, uh, yeah. I suppose the last four weeks. But all I can say about that is uh, firstly, um, I feel that one of the things that has changed in the world, both uh, in India and globally, is the understanding of women's role in political and economic systems. So it's not about giving women rights, it's actually about acknowledging that women have always contributed to historical movements, to, to the political and economic process. Okay. Women are 50% of the world's population. And yes, their contribution has been uh, equal, if not more than men. It's just that what we count as contribution is what is being challenged through fe the feminist lens. And so in that sense, I feel that we have definitely made forward movement, both uh, in India and, and globally. We are standing on the shoulders of giants. We are standing on shoulders of our foremothers, uh, not just in India, but everywhere in the world, who have fought very valiantly for their rights to be treated as human beings. So this is something that we are building on. And I, I feel that, um, the, the sustainability and uh, stability of any society depends on recognizing the contributions that uh, women and, and the other gendered communities make to the structures, the social, political, economic structures that keep us together. Brilliant. Very good answer. Uh, Robson, <laughs> excellent. I think you have uh, voiced our collective uh, voice of the women's movement and the feminist movement over the last 70 years. Uh, Professor Nilima, what your response? Yeah, yeah uh, Mr. Abdullah, um, in fact, I would like to draw your attention to COVID-19 uh, pandemic and uh, also how nations with the uh, women uh, you know, uh, leaders they uh, handled the situation and uh, how uh, the impact was uh, sort of cushioned and uh, the citizens of those countries were so much reassured of what the, their government was doing for them and, and how they were relating will give you, um, uh, will you know, make you understand that gender diversity in leadership at all levels is very, very important. And that is why in every forum, gender diversity uh, is, is uh, the underlying principle because it brings in different perspectives which are overlooked by the other section. It is not this, that men don't have perspective, uh, perspectives. They have equally important and, uh, uh, and very useful understanding of the situation. But there has to be a 360 degree understanding of a situation for which different perspectives needs to be built in. And not only build in, accept it and implement it. Because most of the time, women's voices are not considered, are not uh, taken very seriously. Although things have changed in parts, as I said in my presentation in the last uh, you know, couple of decades, there has been the change in the situation. But invariably, if you look at micro level, if you look in the fam at the level of family or at the level of your community, women are still not taken seriously because it is taken that they are not equally educated, they are not so exposed, and they don't know what's happening around the world, which is what is important when we, and their agencies never, never respected or never even accepted. So for that matter, uh, that is why we are, uh, you know, uh, advocating the gender uh, equality needs to be, you know, um, uh, needs to be implemented at all levels. And it is in the benefit for both men and women. People say that feminist policies will, uh, uh, will affect only women. No, it will disproportionately, uh, you know, impact both. It is true that they will impact uh, women more than men, which is, which will just turn the tables around because general policies impact men in a in a in a more uh, impactful way, and the side effects or the or the by default effects come to uh, you know women. Now we are, we are talking that things from a women uh, lens or a gender perspective, a gender lens and feminist perspective, because that will bring in a different understanding of the same situation, which has been. Which, which could not be perhaps, uh, and 
and uh, because women have been subjected to patriarchal uh, you know conditioning so we can very easily understand what men wants to say and what they are thinking yeah but now the men have that is why gender has been included in gender equality and it we, are, we don't want to call about uh, uh, you know women's equality we want gender equality that let there be a level playing field which i which i mentioned in my uh, you know presentation that merely bringing them across the table is has not served the purpose they have to be uh, you know uh, given the level playing field where they can uh, you know they can uh, express or they can also uh, you know um, contribute in a major way which is i gave an example of handling uh, covid 19 this thing now coming to your uh, uh, you know globalizing no uh, contribution so i would like to add one more very important things that women contribution had always been there but it was invisible and not acknowledged and not documented also so now feminist uh, historians have brought out such a uh, good information and knowledge about how women have always been participating and also in, uh, influential in bringing about any social change whatever you may you know uh, look world over now globalization and feminism in present uh, you know contemporary situation vis-a-vis -vis india so there is a very wrong notion that feminism is fading it is not fading in fact it is spreading its root but not under the rubric of feminism because people have problem uh, you know calling it feminism but the sensitivity and the consciousness is now is now can be seen even in growing children in adolescents if you look at uh, greta thunberg what is she does she call herself a feminist she is not but she has a feminist consciousness that she says that climate change is affecting the present generation and it will affect the future generations in a much more uh, detrimental way so uh, let's not you know uh, just say ki we feminism is like that a feminism so uh, the 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 you know underlying uh, as i said the consciousness is is you know uh, getting more uh, entrenched in all the societies and that is why we see the change Uh, in the next generation which is again uh, not very well documented by the policy makers so we would uh, make sure that such small incremental changes should also be reported and documented and disseminated to bring about a real change at the grassroots thank you so much i thank think you. i'm going to be more for bringing up the issue of uh, 360 degree understanding very important now professor alia khan please introduce yourself and speak Uh, thank you um, professor vibhuti um i'm alia khan retired professor of economics from qaid azam university islamabad and uh, uh, first of all i would like to pay uh, you know a <laughs> lot of tribute uh, to professor nilma and professor meenal for really uh giving excellent uh, lectures on um the context of foreign feminist foreign policy um my all all the time i was thinking of what are the pathways for advocating um the value and the need for feminist foreign policy given uh that uh at high level political forums uh the feminist point of view is not a uh, sort of uh, intertwined with the policy debates that uh, take place and uh, i agree that just the representation of women as foreign service officials foreign uh, you know um, as ambassadors or foreign secretaries is not enough uh, and is not uh, maybe it is a necessary but not a sufficient uh, condition so uh, i was thinking that uh, since the feminist movement has really stood up on the slogans and the practice of solidarity and collaboration uh is there um, i mean is that a pathway that for example the achievement of sustainable development goals will not be possible if a feminist foreign policy uh, is not uh, lens is not applied to international collaboration because i'm talking about the sdgs because they 
take up uh, all the issues of economic growth, of climate change, of uh, you know, of gender equality, uh, cross-cuttingly. So I would like uh, you know either uh, Professor Meenal or Professor Nilma, whoever feels like giving a short response, because I realize that time is running okay, short. Time. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Dr. Aparna Rai Chaudhary. Uh, Aparna Chaudhary, please ask your question or interview. Dr. Aparna Chaudhary. Aparna ji, please unmute yourself. Okay, yes. Please yeah. go ahead. Aparna ji. Hello. Yes. Am I audible Hi. now? Yeah, yes. yeah, you are audible. Yes. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Ma'am, uh, I am just wondering if we have to categorize feminist foreign policy under which category we can list it. Is it hard power politics or is it soft power politics? If it is hard power politics, then how it is different from a contemporary foreign policy that is male dominated foreign policy? And if it is soft power politics, then ma'am, are we not exactly uh, confirming the kind of stereotypes attached with the uh, uh, women? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much. Very, very important question and makes a very challenging <laughs> question. Please also introduce yourself. There was a third question also from, I think, Madam, uh, yeah, Tanuja Sachdev. Dr. Tanuja Sachdev, please ask your question. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Dr. Tanuja Sachdev. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Nilema and Professor Meenal for uh, wonderful lectures. Um, Professor Meenal, um, uh, you know, your lecture so clearly and so lucidly explained how uh, just making women visible in international relations is not enough. Uh, you know, we do not realize a comprehensive feminist foreign policy. And, um, uh, um, I've, I've, you know, and Professor Nilima earlier mentioned about, you know, how people are re reluctant to take up um, or talk about feminism. And so I felt that one very important term that we haven't taken up at all and that can sort of camouflage. Um, how do we, how, how about talking about hegemonic masculinity based understanding of power? Because that is what we are, um, you know, that is what we are confronting. When we talk about IR, we are talking about IR not being a neutral field, it is structurally masculine. So, uh, you know, instead of talking feminism, if we talk about the existence of, I'm just, playing around with the semantics of it all, uh, a hegemonic masculinity-based understanding of power. Uh, that was one, maybe a little frivolous comment here. Uh, the second, um, you know, the title of our course has been Praxis for a Peaceful and Gender Just World. And we are aware that um, all the discussions about the feminist perspectives uh, um, from the, uh, the perspective that Professor Meenal has taken up today is confined to the academic world. You know, there are lectures, there are uh, articles, there are books, um, and it's confined to the academic world. Um, how do we bridge this? And this is what one of the earlier uh, person questioned. How do we make inroads into the policy making world? because that is a close clique. How do we make interventions there? You know, here, non-governmental organizations have no role to play. Um, you know, it functions in the area of aid. And there also we've seen how a number of NGOs uh, in recent years have been co-opted. So looking at the political economic framework and so on. So how do interventions take place? Or will this continue to be a divide between academic discussions and praxis. And praxis here, one is talking about the real world of policy making, where men or women is about following the discourse of hegemonic masculinity, its values, its principles. Um, third, last 
uh, bit. And this is in the context of contemporary European politics. We are talking about feminist perspectives and look what has happened in Ukraine today and uh, what has happened in the past one year. And so the discussions that are taking place about how Europe also needs to become nuclear, whether Korea or Japan, uh, what this single, um, you know, this war in Ukraine has done has fired up yet once again the need to have, you know, nuclear weapons. So, you know, this is such a glaring reality in front of us. Where will the feminist be able to make inroads uh, with regard to this, you know, the old traditional focus on national security, while all along the last two decades, we've been talking about alternative forms of national security. Thank you so much. I raised all these questions and some comments. Thank you. Um, yeah, over so to Professor Mina. Yeah. Thank you. These are some really very uh, important questions. They're very thought provoking, but they're also quite interconnected. So um, I'm, I'm I'll try to distill the essence of these questions uh, or we'll take the liberty of doing that in the, in the interest of time. Um, and what I think the most important thing here that was raised in all these very important questions by uh, Dr. Stanuja Parna and Ali, uh, Alia, the, I think the crux, crux of the issue is how do we make this work, right? So yes, we understand feminism. We understand the importance of feminism or some people do. At the same time, feminism has been maligned as a concept, as, as something uh, you know, that is to be feared rather than um, embraced. But at the same time, as uh, uh, Dr. Neelima Srivastava said, uh, feminism has made inroads even if it's not acknowledged as such, it has made inroads into the public consciousness in a way that was, uh, that is relatively new in some ways. But what I would like to say here is that firstly, I would like to acknowledge the fact that we are seeing those inroads being made. Um, I, I would not brush aside the academic insights uh, to say that this is just a happening in the ivory towers. I don't think so because I feel that uh, a lot of this understanding of what is it, what has been missing and how do we make it apparent has happened in, uh, you know, th through research. And that research is percolating in the public domain in a variety of ways. But as academics, it is up to us to make our research more applicable to be accessible, not applicable, but accessible. To making, our, uh, to making our voices heard in ways that we are not just talking within echo chambers. I think that's a very important point to raise. Uh, so how do we build these bridges between policymaking and, uh, and feminism or con the concerns that feminism raises, which is beyond just women, it's, it, that it is a much broader concern. Uh, and in that, again, the insights that we have from academic understanding of how do policies get made that's another important aspect that, uh, that has to be brought to the fore. And again, those connections need to be built. There is a very big obstacle in all of that, that yes, we, we can understand things and we can work towards them. But one of the biggest obstacles is the declining strength of democratic institutions, where instead of public interest determining policies, we now have vested interests, lobbyists and corporate interests that are determining policies. Uh, which affect the public. So the, again, those, those insights come from research, but at the same time, we, we have to have a, a greater collaboration between not just policymakers and academics, but activists and academics, mm -hmm. citizens and academics. And I believe that more academics should take to storytelling uh, just, uh, you know, I, I don't mean to be flippant about storytelling. I think storytelling is, is mm -hmm. a very important tradition. It, it, is, it is a tradition that exists in all societies. And it is one way in which we can make our voices heard. So uh, I, I'm a great believer in that. It is something I have come to quite belatedly in my life as well. But I can see the power of that. I can see that the conversations I have through relational stories that are based on these concepts are totally different compared to 
you know, my academic writing that obviously happens in echo chambers and has, and the, and the people have no access to it. You know, I, I don't want to go into the corporatization of, of universities and, and academic publication, but, uh, but thank you. Again global publications question. are controlling all knowledge sources. Our own books are sold for 11,000 and 15,000 rupees. We don't have exactly. access to it. Exactly. And we get nothing out of it. This is the other uh, misunderstanding people have. They feel that, you know, oh, these textbooks are so expensive. These academics must make so much money. No, academics don't get any money out of that. So, <laughs> so yes, I, I, that's that's an aside. But these are really important questions. They, they require a lot of thoughtful engagement. And thank you for raising them. Thank you, Professor Minil. Very, very. It touched both our head and heart. Your, your response. Uh, Dr. Nilima, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I will quickly res uh, respond to the questions raised by Alia, Aparna, and Tanuja. Uh, and as uh, said by Meenal, they're all interconnected. And uh, Alia, yes, solidarity is very, very important for any movement and for a movement which uh, rests on the shoulders of people who are not readily accepted until unless we have solidarity, it will not be noticed. So it remains the underlying principle of any, any uh, mobilization or resistance that is put up by any section of the society. And coming to the soft or hard policy, I would, I would uh, you know, suggest and I would appeal that let's be consistent and steadily and working towards it rather than looking at the what kind of or how to uh, what under I put it under what nomenclature or what kind of uh, you know um, kind of um, uh, the uh, the you know uh, what to you know uh, what label to give it so that will be this thing then about Ukraine war suddenly a very very interesting thought came to my mind that what if Sultana's dreams come true there'll be no wars in this Word. So, so let's hope that Sultana dream come true in our lifetimes. And uh, uh, responding to Tanuja, you say that uh, if you, I'll draw your attention uh, to the fact that social that women's movement had to uh, enter into academia to make it uh, you know powerful and to uh, to broaden its base. Because until and unless the classroom teaching, uh, you know, also talks about uh, invisualization and migration of women, which was a very, very hard for journey. And we from women's studies know knows that how difficult it was to enter into academic world and academia. So until and unless uh, the, the academic uh, understanding of what is happening in society is analyzed, is told, as said, we, Storytelling is a is a very is a very easy word, but it is about talking. It is about it is disseminating. So, which is you know in, in general parlance, it is storytelling. And women have built their knowledge by storytelling only. So, uh, I would say that yes, of course, hegemonic masculinity is uh, is also it impacts the uh, the people who propagate it or who follow it. So it is not, uh, you know, good for them to, but this is how, uh, you know, the society has thrived to, you know, uh, come up with controls, whether it is patriarchy or hegemonic masculinity. So all these, uh, you know, that's what we, yeah, I said in one of my slides, that patriarchal structures along with masculinity constructs. This is, which is what I feel now that, uh, you know, femininity constructs have changed over a period of time. But masculinity constructs remains the same, which is why there is so much of insecurity and uh, you know uh, unacceptance of women, violence. women power. So say, they say ki ab kahan zarurat hai? Women are as good as uh, men, but no, we are talking of of all of us who are at a better uh, you know place and at a better uh, you know yes. situation and lifestyles but if you look around us the situation is really very grim and one feels very very sorry that and there was a report that it will take another six generations for world to see gender parity or gender equality so that was very very hard it is happening when i read about it in one of the report that we can accelerate the um, you know, a change. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nilima, for bringing so many important concerns about the challenges that are faced by feminist foreign policy and status of women uh, and the gender relations in nation states. Uh, both of all three uh, speakers, I think Ambassador Anil Trigunayat, 
Professor Minil Srivastav and Professor Nilima Srivastava. All of three, uh, all three of them have brought in extremely important concerns, and the whole session has been a very rewarding in terms of our alternative and the, the, the pathways that we are seeking for the global peace and uh, security and gender equality. Feminist concerns, uh, uh, what they have tried to drive at is that feminist concerns must be tackled effectively in multiple policy areas to ensure that governments do not simply pay lip service to feminist foreign policy and development policy. Uh, this encompass gender, in, in gender justice, countering erosion of public sector services. I think that Dr. Minel also brought up uh, the question of how financialization of social sector that is happening, moving beyond both uh, uh, the conservative uh, uh, economic policies and also the colonial, uh, post-colonial uh, extraction of the uh, very predatory uh, cap uh, way in which the global capitalism is operating. So a uh, growing number of countries when are, they are jumping into the bandwagon of feminist foreign policy, I think we need to scrutinize this, the, the motives and scrutinize the way they are operationalized in a very judicious way. We all have a very painful experience of the global pandemic and how the commercialization of health services play, played havoc with most of the African countries, uh, which were completely left without any kind of support services. And uh, Dr. Nilima also brought up the question of that wherever the women leaders were there, they, they put profit before people before profit and they came up with a very uh, uh, poly, uh, intervention uh, to uh, combat corona in a very, very humane way, and they were able to contain the negative impact of corona. So uh, whatever foreign feminist foreign policies we are talking about, we need to walk the talk. And I think it's a very important that uh, whether it is a world trade organization or general agreement on trade and tariffs or, or the uh, macroeconomic policies everywhere, we need to see to it that it doesn't remain just a rhetorics, but it also gets operationalized and a lot of solidarity, as I think Dr. Alia also brought up the issue of solidarity is very important. I think we have had very, very, all the four sessions were extremely educative. And I think for the first time, I think in India, this issue has been discussed. So I think give us some time because we are, well, the whole 5,000 years of patriarchy uh, has been challenged by the women's movement over the last 100 years. But still, what we have gained in terms of new uh, perspectives, new sensibilities, expanding the horizons of human rights. I think that is the very important uh, uh, lesson that we have and let us be optimistic. I don't think, I don't accept the kind of predictions which are made that it will take some six generations to get gender equality. I think all of us, when we, we get united and make concerted effort, changes, other, another world is possible. Uh, world with gender justice, social justice, economic justice, environment justice is possible. And now I request uh, our main sponsor for today's uh, our collaborator, uh, Dr. Madam Jyoti Rawal, to give her concluding remarks. My apologies, sorry. Yeah. No. So thank you so much uh, for this excellent panel. Really, really insightful. Uh, uh, and thought-provoking uh, discussions that we've had. And I mean, in, in the interest of time and in the interest of uh, also Professor Srivastava, who's been, we've kept you awake, uh, uh, you know, so late in the night, almost must be like early morning for you. Um, I just want to say that it's been, it's been great. All the sessions and the concluding session, of course, has been really the you know, the icing on the cake with the, all your insights. And the only thing I would like to say is that we look at it as conversational beginners. I think the conversation has just begun on this topic in our spaces. A lot of, uh, you know, walk the talk needs to happen. And we need to really see that the, uh, the academic eco chambers that you spoke about, uh, Professor Srivastava, how we can take things like storytelling and other forms and make it into praxis. So that's uh, what one is hoping to kind of, uh, you know, to see it unfold in time to come. So thank you so much. We really hope that we keep the conversations going and uh, we stay connected. Thank you so much. 
Now, okay. I think, yeah, in pretty, yeah, Tripta, please. Thank you so much, ma'am. So as we come to an end of session four, the concluding session on gender international relations and diplomacy of an online monsoon school program on feminist foreign policy, taxes for a gen peaceful and gender just world order organized by FES India office and IMPRI Gender Impact Study Center, GISC. I, Tripta Behra, researcher, IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, would like to propose the formal vote of thanks. We are grateful to our experts for the day four of this monsoon school, Professor Meena Shavasta, Ambassador Anil Trigonyat, and Professor Nilima Shavasta. Thank you so much for such excellent presentations and such great interactions. We thank our conveners, Ms. Jyoti Rawal and Dr. Simi Mehta and Dr. Rajan Kumar. We thank all of our participants who have raised pertinent questions and actively participated in today's deliberation. Thank you for being interested and putting your time, energy, and efforts into understanding emerging issues concerning the impacts of policies in promoting gender equality and foreign policy, helping us to bring together the practitioners and participants through this course for impactful policy research and action. We are grateful if you are watching us later on YouTube or listening to us on our various podcasts or reading our publications. We hope you continue to join in in the future to IMPRI hashtag web policy talks and web policy learning. Those who've attended all four sessions will be send, sent a feedback form over the email for uh, obtaining participation certificates. So do watch out for that. Until then, wishing you all a very good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for joining. Thank you, everyone. Bye, take care. Take care.